Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the uh, Engineering Talent Awards nominee interviews. This is actually the third in the series of our webinar interviews, led by myself, Fayon Dixon and David Purgy. Um, we're in discussion with those who were nominated for awards this year. Now with the awards ceremony itself, it was supposed to take place last month, but because of the uh, COVID pandemic, we're actually postponing and it's now going to be on September the 9th. So um, we're really looking forward to that. Now, we're going to invite you, of course, to ask questions today. There is a Q&A um, facility there at the bottom of your screen. So please do send through your questions. And if you have a technical question as well, please send those through. I won't be dealing with it, but we have <laughs> Fraser on hand to help you out. And uh, all the webinars that we're doing, of course, will be recorded and you can play them back once they're all completed and please do share them. So um, today I am delighted, and you've heard her voice already and you've seen her, so spoilers are out. We are, or I am talking to Brogan McDonald, who is a graduate, a graduate structural engineer at Ramble, um, and she's been nominated for the Graduate of the Year. Welcome officially, Brogan. Really good to properly meet you. How are you doing? Thank you so much, Fian. Um, I'm really glad to be here. It's really lovely to um, to have this experience since we couldn't have the awards last month. So it's really nice to be able to talk to you still and um, keep us going until the awards ceremony in September. Excellent, excellent. Well, let's kick off straight away and tell us about the company that you work for and your graduate role. Okay, so um, I work for Ramble and they're a multidisciplinary um, engineering design and consultancy company and they're based in 35 countries around the world um, and we have over 16 and a half employees um, all around the world and um, so quite a quite a large company and I work in the structures team in our um, head office in London so I work in um, quite a specialised structures team we do um, some really fun cool projects a lot of existing building refurbishments um, anything from high fashion refurbishments uh, recently uh, finished the Louis Vuitton store on New Bond Street to um, designing installations in the Tate Modern. I've helped um, support over 10 um, art installations there and helped with the engineering um, and the infrastructure behind them to doing um, residential schemes in really challenging constraint sites. So my, my job is very diverse in, in itself. Um, I do lots of different types of engineering and design and I think it's really fun. It sounds fantastic because I know you have a great love of art and everything creative. So you're going to live the dream there, aren't you? Yeah, I, I do pinch myself sometimes because I was very creative when I was young. Um, I won a Blue Peter badge for drawing when I was five. And at that point, everyone was like, you know, she's going to she's going to do art. And I was quite I was on that path to do art for quite a while. Um, you know, drawing in school, I took all the subjects that suggested to do a, a career in um, a creative field, you know, lots of art, uh, graphic communication, music. Um, and, you know, I always felt like it was going to be something I wanted to do. Um, it was a little bit later down the line when I was about 16 that I discovered my, my love for problem solving and um, how I could combine my passion for art and I always loved buildings as well, being fascinated with buildings and how they work together and then combine my problem solving. And um, I thought architecture was was the one for quite a while. I thought that's the great mix. And I remember very clearly my art teacher saying, don't be an architect. You only design toilets. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Which is not true. I mean, they have to design toilets sometimes. Um, and information from. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so she said, we don't be an architect, the waste of your talents and your skills. And I, and even though she wasn't really speaking much truth, I'd listened to her at the time, as you do when you're a student, you listen to your teachers now and again. Um, and I explored other avenues um, of where I could apply creativity and my like for problem solving. I wasn't the best at maths or science as a child. I never would have dreamed to be doing something as technical as I do now. And I did struggle to obtain 
the grades that I needed to go and study engineering. Um, and I discovered this course that was structural engineering with architecture. And that seemed to me, I went to the open day and I thought, oh, this is such the perfect um, collaboration of both my, my skills. You know, it's designing and problem solving and understanding how things work um, in buildings and infrastructure with actually the design element um, and creating um, better buildings and infrastructure. So I really liked that, how that kind of coalition, how they work together. So yeah, I went from being an art, uh, as you know, an artist to being an engineer. And there are often things that people would think are worlds apart, but I have grown to understand that they're actually very, very similar um, in many senses and um, they're very important towards each other. So refreshing to hear because I meet so many young people that are so creative and never dream that they could have a career in that way. But you've been in your role now for 18 months and you're doing it. So what are the major challenges as a graduate now working in the environment? I think there's I think there's a lot of challenges being a graduate in general um, regardless of industry. You have to go from being a, you know, a university student, which is you know a completely different kind of environment uh, you you make up your own rules a little bit when you're a student you know you um, have your own timetable and you can choose whether you want to attend classes of course I attended online um, but you know you go from that and then having that kind of autonomy and then having to go into a real world of work where you have a new environment lots of new people um, with so many different characteristics and behaviors that you have to um, respond to and understand to having an actual routine and having to be you know present at a certain time um, I'm very fortunate I you know that I work in a company that promotes flexible working but you know there's a lot of people that have to be you know at their desk at nine o'clock so there's a lot of challenges of being a graduate in general I think regardless of industries um, and going from that university to the graduate roles is a, a big challenge but I also think engineering um, isn't much different to um, other other industries. I think it's difficult to be a graduate in lots of professional industries, whether you're in engineering or finance or doing a graduate scheme at a supermarket. I think there's always the difficulty of being a young person and going into into a new role. Um, it's you know you struggle to understand how things work. You have to spend so much time absorbing information and it's really it can be really mentally challenging and that's across all starting all types of new jobs and um, in engineering in particular and um, there's two main environments so you have a kind of consultancy design based office role or you might have a site role um, and they come with lots of different um, obstacles you know um, in terms of how it is being a graduate and you know across the industry it is it can be just challenging to be a woman in a professional field um, often I am sitting at a meeting and I might be the only woman there and um, so that's something that I got used to through studying as well um, there is not a high percentage of women studying engineering so by the time you're in a workplace it's quite normal um, you know to feel like that um, but so it can be quite difficult to get your voice heard sometimes um, because of your age or gender um, or many other factors. So, you know, it's 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 a challenge for everyone um, being a graduate, I think. And um, getting 18 months in is um, a big achievement for anyone in a graduate scheme. But I think we're also quite lucky being in an engineering scheme, as I have so many of my friends who have graduated with amazing degrees, first class in so many types of um, amazing subjects but they don't have a career path that's got a roadmap for them. Engineers have graduate schemes, they have placements, they have all these kind of infrastructure in place to have a career in engineering but my one of my best friends is um, the most intelligent person I know and she uh, graduated with languages and there's not the same structure to go and pursue a career so I think um, there's positive negatives of course um, but I've I've loved it and I've had a really really good experience yes. um, working at Ramble so yeah so you know how much of your time then is kind of dedicated as a graduate to promoting equality and diversity in your role um quite a lot of mine um you know it's a very individual thing um and if you want to promote it is kind of on a voluntary basis of course um so 
on my first day of work, the first thing that I asked to do was to sign up to be a STEM ambassador through the program because it was something that I had kind of done a bit at university and I was really passionate about. Um, there's such it's such an importance to have those role models there and people to inspire the next generation of engineers since we have this skills gap um, in STEM. So, you know, it's a voluntary position to work in STEM and, and to, do, to be a STEM ambassador. So it was the first thing that I did. Um, and through my work in STEM, I started to explore other areas and um, in ways that I could help diversity and inclusion at Ramble. And um, I, I actually joined the Women's Engineering Society about a year ago um, as an individual member um, that Ramble supported me through. And I started attending meetings and seeing how it could benefit me personally um, and how it could be potentially benefit Ramble. So I absolutely loved it. I think it's a fantastic organisation. And um, working with the Talent Inclusion Director at Ramble, we established over a space of six months um, a corporate partnership um, that we just signed up for um, in December. And we've had loads of benefits from it so far. So I'm leading the corporate partnership at Ramble so we have um, 17 members um, in across the UK right from um, Edinburgh down to Southampton so that's really brilliant. That's really great and um, you become a bit of a sustainability champion haven't you and um, you've joined that task force in Ramble's building division so why is it so important that you can be involved in what actually is happening? Oh, well, good question. Um, I've always really been passionate about sustainability. Um, even before I actually knew much about it, to be honest, I became a vegetarian when I was nine, um, much to my family's hate <laughs> at the time as I was. What made you do it? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't like I didn't like meat at the time um, without going into too much detail. I just didn't feel right with me. Um, so. I, I gave up. I didn't give up very well at first. I went back and I did eat um, Chinese, uh, I think it was like um, crispy fried beef two weeks later. <laughs> but <laughs> um, but uh, it, it felt important to me. So that was the kind of first step where I started to think about my choices. Um, so I was only nine. And then about four years ago, I became a vegan. Um, with an ambition to further reduce you know, animal consumption and to help climate change. Obviously watching quite a few documentaries about it, um, while they are designed to focus on one particular area of the subject, I, you know, I don't agree with everything that they say and do, but it really made me focus on how much impact that I could have personally on, um, on carbon emissions in the planet. So I, I gave up um, dairy um, at the time which was quite a big deal for me because I loved cheese. <laughs> um, and, um, and then... King Rat, and the two of you have got the same birthday, so maybe it's a amazing <laughs> thing. <laughs> um, yeah, I, um, I, I, I used to come home after a few drinks and nibble on some cheese. So, yeah, I, um, it, was, um, it was a big deal for me to give that up. Um, and, you know, I, I still do miss it. So, um, you know, it was a big choice. And then over the past couple of years it's developed into how I could make more choices personally. Um, I've changed all my kind of skincare and beauty routines to plastic free or vegan um, vegan things so there's been lots of changes I've made personally and when I started my role I kind of spent the first six months to a year kind of watching as you do when you start a new job you watch what happens you learn you absorb and then it was about about six months ago that I started to kind of pick up on things that I think we could do better in terms of sustainability. Um, Ramble do amazing work across sustainability already, but there's always things that we can improve on yeah. and advance. Um, so I was picking up on things that, you know, I think we could do a little bit better um, and, you know, just kind of testing the waters. You know, I'd ask, I'd ask my colleagues what they think about this and if, is this something that we could implement on with a client? Um, and you know we have a client I'm working with at the moment that's that's very um, you know that kind of prides themselves in sustainability and um, they're quite keen to try out new things. So um, that kind of kind of snowballed into me doing a lot of work in circular economy in, in particular. So I'm looking at um, how if we demolish a building, 
how we can reuse the, the elements within that building um, directly into another building mm-hmm. um, as they are in the in the raw um, in the raw sense. For example, uh, you were to demolish a steel frame building, could we re- reuse those steel beams into another project? Mm-hmm. And that comes with a world of challenges within itself, um, from commercial to um, liability to financial things. So it's very much an an exploring um, opportunity right now. Um, And with all my projects, I'm always trying to promote the lowest carbon solution, you know, um, but you always have to, uh, you know, put that into the client's eyes and show it in terms of um, financial risk and um, all their other kind of um, things that they look at um, when it comes to the project. So I've, been really lucky that I've managed to be able to have my voice heard and um, which has been amazing and be able to work on some really cool projects and start some s- sustainability um, work. There is a lot to be done in the construction sector and um, buildings in construction account for 40% of the global CO2 emissions so we have a huge obligation to do something about it um, as an engineer and there isn't enough being done in the industry because of many reasons, of course. Um, so I think we have to start small and try. And once you see one person doing it, then others do it and follow suit. And the challenge at the moment is getting those solid case studies together because there's not really many in the UK at all. The Nordics do it really well. And as a, as Rambler, our Danish company, we're very lucky that we can um, kind of connect with our um, with our Danish colleagues to work on some projects together and they provide us with good case studies and work that we can share with our clients here and um, so it's really it's it's really important that we continue that dialogue and manage you know to kind of transition the sustainability drive in the nordics over to the uk yeah I mean, you mentioned so many great points. One of the ones I wanted to pick up on is, you know, carrying this over to the next generation, making sure that, the, you know, those coming through realise this responsibility. And I know that you have um, recently completed an engineering education scheme of the year 12. And, yeah. you know, giving these young people that, you know, permission to be empowered to take these steps is so fantastic. What's it like going into schools and working with uh, young people in that way? Yeah, it was it's it was amazing. It was such a good experience. Um, so as a background, we um, ramble and um, take part of this scheme, the EES scheme every year. And it's a six month long program where we mentor students um, in year 12 um, to partake in an industry led project. So the idea is you give them, uh, you set them a brief to create this project of your choice and you mentor them through the stages and at the end they create uh, a final report and a physical model of the project. So previous projects varied from anything like um, robotics parts, about how to fly to the, to the, to the moon, um, to creating buildings to um, zip wires and anything and everything that you could dream of um, has been done before so we um, it wasn't just myself I, I was working with a few other graduates at Ramble and we all sat down and thought what would be a really great um, project for these students to learn about and to work on and there was an empty con- there's an empty construction site just across the road um, in Blackfriars where our office is based that we thought would be a really good um, kind of base case for them to look at because they can see it's empty so they can visualize it really well um, coming to the site. So we gave them um, a task to build a pavilion that would go in this in this new site that could be used by the public um, in this park space that, would, that could be used for local office workers to relax in during the day. Um, so through the six months they had that brief at the beginning and um, we helped them kind of conceptualize ideas um, and you know show them how you know design process works um, in kind of architecture and engineering and then right through to how to design the elements structurally so that they would work and they wouldn't be blown over in the wind to writing a report how to write a technical report um, to creating the physical model we created we went to Brighton University and used their lab facilities there to create um, a kind of big model at this size um, so they could kind of see how things work together and we looked at construction joints and um, to the final day which was a presentation and we taught them how like presentation skills and you know how to 
you know, convey ideas and how to story tell. So, you know, so much information in six months. And I, I mm. like, I would have loved to have that opportunity at the same time because, gosh, I, I struggled in my first year of uni how to write reports. I just didn't understand them because nobody showed me how they should be structured. Mm. So it was, a, it was a really great process. And the kind of lovely chair in the top moment was throughout it, we encouraged them to use sustainable materials. Um, teaching them about things such as um, cross laminated timber um, and they decided to use that timber um, in their project to make this pavilion which meant it was a very low carbon design and they themselves in kind of encompassed all these lovely social sustainable values within this, this within the project um, without even actually having to physically do it on purpose they kind of did it uh, you know themselves because I think you know, Gen Z and, um, you know, children that are growing up now are very aware of the issues of sustainability. Yeah. And that's the one thing that's really important. And I always suggest to people when they have project design teams to always get in a kind of a fresh pair of eyes, someone younger, um, because they understand, you know, they can understand the client differently um, and they can sometimes identify things that hadn't been thought about before. And it's really important as well for, you know, designing inclusive spaces. There's sometimes things that people are not aware of. Um, a project recently that I was working on had a very shiny floor mm. and that's, um, that can be really challenging to people who suffer with dementia. Absolutely, yeah. So it's just highlighting these, these small things that some people aren't aware of. Um, and I think that's, I digress from sustainability, but I think that's really um, important as well mm. that you have a really diverse project group with lots of backgrounds um, that can identify, you know, and bring different parts to a project team. And that's why I think um, diversity is really important as well um, when we're in projects. Sorry, I completely digress from the question. That's okay. It's really fascinating talking to you because, you know, you're so passionate about your role. And like you said at the beginning, you have to pinch yourself sometimes just to, you know, realize where you are because you're just doing what you love so much. And, uh, you know, not many people can say at your age that they have designed a sculpture that has actually been displayed in central London. And I happen mm -hmm. to know that you did the uh, Talk to Me sculpture, which was in King's Cross. Um, can you just tell us about this? It's absolutely a fantastic project. I've looked into it. I believe I saw it when I was going through yeah. myself. But do tell us about that. Yeah, that was that's definitely been a, a career highlight for me. And even being so young, um, you know, a few of my colleagues said, you know, that's going to be something that you'll remember and that you'll use in examples for my chartership report. It was such an amazing project to be a part of. We were approached, um, Ramble were approached by Stuart Padwick, who is a furniture designer. Um, and he designed um, a sculpture called uh, Head Above Water last year that was used, that was on the South Bank. So um, you know, a few of my colleagues had supported that project previously. And he came back to us the following year, said, I want to do another project for Mental Health Awareness Week. Um, and it's gonna be in collaboration with Design Junction Week, which is like a London design festival. And he showed us these these amazing ideas of these huge timber sculptures of people standing and sitting. And it was incredible, really cool project. So um, our role, Ramble's role, um, so it was myself and a few colleagues worked on it, um, was to basically take this concept and make it into reality, into something that could be safely built um, and manufactured and stand there for a week um, during uh, September. September it was so that through a lot of um, iterations um, we had to try a lot of different design ideas we 3d printed a few versions of the model in our office and we had a few workshops with the designer to look at geometry and how it would stand up excuse me how it stand up and um, so my role was basically taking his commuter model and making them into five and a half meter tall timber sculptures wow. so yeah it was really it was really great um we uh, designed designed them out of cross laminated timber and um with steel plates together that hold all the connections so my role was making sure that the model stand, like stood up safely so i would do some calculations for that 
and I did sketches um, for it to be uh, manufactured. Um, we did some CAD drawings as well, right through to supporting um, the construction phase as well and looking at um, risk assessments and getting approvals from the infrastructure owner in that area because we're putting um, quite a heavy load onto the pavement. We had to ensure that it was wouldn't crack the pavement and it was safe and there's so many kind of public realm things you had to think about when we're designing it so I kind of managed all those little bits and bobs um so this is over nine ten weeks was quite quick went from so quick. looking at it yeah looking at it to it actually being built so a really quick program um which meant I didn't have much time to do it and I was quite busy on projects mm -hmm. so um Ramble have an amazing scheme called making a difference where we can support um charity projects um you know they can be approached by us or we can volunteer to help some projects that are existing within the network already so we we this was a charity project for us so we did this as a pro bono job and um, so I got to do a little bit of time and work not much but most of it was in my free time mm -hmm. so it was it was quite stressful um ironically about mental health but you know the end result was just amazing and it was so worth it and the final result is two timber sculptures um five and a half meters long one is standing with a weight on its head um can suggest that um not sharing how you feel is a kind of burden on your shoulders and the other one is this kind of lovely comparison of someone who's sitting against that that weight and that kind of once you release that burden and you release um how you're feeling it can make you feel more comfortable um and you don't have that heavy feeling on your shoulders anymore mm. so um they were also set up by some other engineers to have um, voice and um, some lighting too. So um, yeah, it was it was a lovely project, and so pleased I got to work on it. I mean, to be able to work on something so innovative yeah, with a designer who's already got an incredible track record, and also to have that personal link because you are quite okay to share that you've had your own challenges with your mm -hmm. own mental health. Do, do you want to expand on that at all? Are you okay with that? Because I know it is something now the, the world um, is one at last that feels that we can share more about mental health and we are seeming to hear more and more experiences from all people from all walks of life. That project must have really helped you, but you know, what have you had to overcome yourself? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very open about sharing, sharing my experience. Um, I'm, I'm well now. Um, well, oh, sometimes, <laughs> and naturally, we all have ups and downs. We're going through a bit of a corona coaster, as they call it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, when I when I was in my when I was a teenager, I really I really struggled. I really battled with depression, and anxiety, um, and it got to a point where it got really bad, where I had to take time off school. So I had a couple of months off school during quite an important part point for school for me uh, was during my standard grades which is the equivalent to GCSEs so just um, not long before I took them um, I must have been about 14 or 15 um, I took a few months off and I basically didn't attend school um, and I studied from home because I just it was too much for me to go into the kind of school environment and I was very overwhelmed so I felt a lot safer to, um, to work from home and my teachers were really great and they supported me through that um, and I, you know, I, I got medication and I got help at the time um, to get through it and I actually managed to sit on my exams in a separate space Ooh. so that I could, um, so I could still concentrate the same and I didn't have to suffer with anxiety purely about getting to the exam, never mind, you know, the exam itself. Yeah. So they were very accommodating uh, in that and I got my separate room and it, I managed to sit on my exams and I got um, all ones and twos, which is A's and B's. So from... It was amazing from not going to school for months to still managing to set all my exams. There was one subject I had to drop and it was my sciences, which I always find quite funny because I'm an engineer that never took science in school. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they basically, I got too much at one point and they said, we suggest that you drop on your subjects so you have one less. And you, in Scotland, you take quite a lot. You take seven, eight or nine standard yeah, grades at the time. Mm -hmm it's a lot um so I just dropped my science and they still had seven exams so it's still quite a lot um as that 
obviously when I had to apply to uni that was quite a challenge because said you, you want to be an engineer you never even taken science um, as an exam of course. How, how did you get around that then? Is it just that the other subjects you did so well and it had to support or maybe you put a good you know good sort of a UCAS application through? Um, so no um, I actually had to get quite innovative I had my maths and then I had my art and my graphic communication and business management and English they were my hires so they were like my A levels yeah. um, so I was not I didn't have physics or chemistry or biology or whatever that um, they asked for so um, I had to think of how I could obtain that and get enough value that I could use in an engineering course um, and I was very lucky in my final year of school they offered an open university course instead of doing an advanced hire which oh, is like another level so I looked at the opportunities of doing that and I took uh, an equivalent of like between an A-level and a university entry requirement course in um, Engineering the Future, it was called. And that was like a very broad spectrum overview of engineering, mostly focused on like the aeronautical side, um, a lot of space. Um, but it gave me that background to physics that I needed. Um, to go in to do structural engineering because the first module that we do in, in uni is mechanics mm -hmm. and um, I still struggled in my first year a lot because I, I missed that essential kind of next step towards it and I still do struggle sometimes I'm not the most technical engineer like my colleagues know that but it's not the important thing um, I can grasp the basics and the important thing is being able to be a good communicator mm. and being able to problem solve and think outside the box and um, work with people. You know, you know, often people think engineers are strictly just, you know, sitting down, punching at numbers. And mm. while that can be true, well, it can be true, it's not often the case. And yeah. the, the, the things that you require to be an engineer are basically you know, communication and problem solving and being able to work effectively with other people. Um, so, I always challenge someone that says that you need three sciences and maths to get into study engineering, where you might in Oxford or something, but I don't think it's the things that make you a good engineer. Well, you're the proof, aren't you? And <laughs> yeah. Proof of the pudding. You yeah. are. It's so refreshing to hear, because again, when I go into schools and I speak to young people and I ask them, what do you think? the top skills, the 10 top skills employers are looking for, and they always come up with, you know, the things that you would think, you know, the educational side of things, the things that you're being taught at school, and it's, uh, it's always communication, it's always problem solving, team, you know, being a team player, you know, those are always, always at the top. So it is that wonderful balance of, you know, learning and uh, at school, but that life learning that you get as well. And uh, the role that you're in, because you must be working with people of all different ages. So how lovely to be able to develop yourself in such an inclusive environment. It sounds great. It really does. Gosh, yeah. I'm just checking the time, um, and for our wonderful yeah. viewers, hey, <laughs> if you have a question for Bregan about anything at all, you know, I have my questions that I want to ask her, but if you have anything, then do use the Q&A facility, jump in at any time and I'll get to your question. But um, while um, I'm waiting for that, I did want to ask you, um, what would you say to those you know, who, I mean, you, you kind of touched on it just then about not having to have, you know, all the skills that are needed to become an engineer. Is there anything else you would say to anybody that, you know, is really creative, a bit like yourself, a bit artistic, and they've never considered pursuing a career in engineering? What would you tell them? Um, I would tell them to watch, um the art of design on netflix is a really great series about um uh, creatives um across many fields and there's a really good few episodes about science and engineering and how it has this you know beautiful relationship with art um and i think that's a kind of first place to start it can it, it promotes that there's so many opportunities out with standard stereotypical types of engineering um so I would say to explore other avenues. If you like music and you also like maths, I think there's really cool areas to look at in sound production. 
Um, I, you know, and like mine with art and buildings, I really liked looking at the kind of creativity of being an engineer and problem solving. But I think there is, you know, amazing things that you can do with science and art and look at like biophilic design. I think there's so many opportunities. And I also think that you can create and carve a career for yourself um, yeah. within that field. You know, I, I always kind of manifested myself to be this person that loves problem solving and you know an art and I've managed to kind of manifest a career out of it somehow um uh so I think you know not to give up if you're not sure of what it is and to keep exploring but also um if you don't believe that you've done the right subject choices it's never too late to change um or to do something else in the future if you are doing all sciences or you're doing all creative subjects and that's what you want to do then keep going with it but um if you decide that you actually wanted to apply for engineering but you didn't quite have the grades there's always college courses there's apprenticeships there's so many other avenues and i think that people shouldn't feel pressured to go into a job immediately after school or university i was quite lucky that i did but i did consider doing a gap year for a while and i decided not to in the end just because of the cost of it um but you know, still saying that, I do think it's really good to take um, gaps in your career, whether that's because you want to go travel or you just want time off to look after yourself mm -hmm. or you want to raise family. I think there's um, great opportunities and I don't think that people should feel pressured to run in, into a career. Um, I'm glad I did in the end because it's worked out very well for me. But, um, you know, everyone's timelines are different. And, um, you know, I have family members that are wanting to change their career now and in you know in their 40s and there's nothing wrong with that and I say that explore what you want to do and if you find something then just kind of manifest and understand how you can get there and what you can do. Mm, that's so important you know our mental health and well-being is um it's so key and when you feel the pressure sometimes of having to fulfill a role because your parents or your school or even you put the own you know your own pressure on yourself that you have to follow that route and not deviate in any way to me personally that's just not natural you know yeah. deviations can take it's always good to have an end plan but those deviations can take you somewhere where you never thought you could go and when you've got a support network like you have and you know if you're watching this and you're like I, I don't have that kind of support seek it it's out there you know find people to speak to there's just so many groups out there that are really talk about inclusion and diversity and you know any kind of adversity at all so you're really lucky that we live in this age now where people can reach out in this way yeah so, um, absolutely and i just want to add to that as well um you know if you if you didn't feel supported by your family or your your friends or your peers then there is a lot of mentoring support out there for young people. Um, I am a mentor with the Women's Engineering Society. Um, there's some great organizations, for example, STEMETs, that promote um, women in STEM. Yeah, they're amazing. Um, and there's really good organizations out there. So if you feel like you might be lacking in confidence or you might just need someone to reflect your ideas with, there is a great, um, there's great mentoring available. So can I ask you then, let's get back to these awards. <laughs> you, you actually self-nominated yourself. I mean, when did you know it was the right time to do that? Um, so three people messaged me on the same day with this award and said, you should apply. Um, and I, I kind of went, okay, yeah. What's going on? And I, 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 didn't, I didn't say fine. I said, okay. And I sat on it. I like to kind of... When I have a problem that I don't know how to solve, I just sit on it for a few days, mm. as long as I don't need to do it immediately. <laughs> so I sat on it and thought about it. Um, you know, I do my best thinking when, you know, you don't have tech in front of you. I think we're always in front of our phones and computers. And I always come up with my best ideas, like when I'm in the shower or brush my teeth or out for a walk. Yeah. So I, I, like, I like that time to think and reflect. And um, I thought, well, why not? I, I think it's... A good thing to do and I, I actually said at the beginning of the year I kind of wanted to apply for award be shortlisted I thought it'd be great so um, I applied for this one and um, the STEM ambassador award for the ICE which oh. I found out the day that I'm <laughs> which is crazy um, 
and uh, the Weiss Awards recently as well. So they were the three awards that I applied for and unbelievably I've been shortlisted for all of them. Um, so it's incredible. But I do think there's a really good process um, that I think everyone should do when uh, I try to write an award for yourself because I think it's quite reflective and cathartic to write about it. And I actually didn't realise how much stuff I'd done um, until putting it out into a, you know, like a bullet list. And I thought, oh, wow, I actually have done quite a lot and I've promoted really diversity. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I thought it, it was really good. And it's the kind of little boost that you need to give to yourself now and again as well. Um, I mean, I have an amazing um, support network around me um, from family to colleagues that always, you know, they're very appreciative of all the things that I do. Um, but I think it's really important for yourself to kind of, you know, be proud of what you do. Um, and I think, you know, I challenge everyone to try and, you know, write an award for yourself or write about yourself in one way or another during your career. I think that's great. And um, we have a question from Adrienne Houston. Hi, Adrienne. Thank you for sending your question. Um, she says, it is amazing that the engineering stereotype of being dirty and in a hard hat is discussed and that your engineering career is more creative and artistic. Very interesting. And thank you for your honesty on your mental health. Um, do you want to respond? It's uh, high praise. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank, thank you so much. You know, that is that is why I do it. Um, I really want to show young people that, you know, an engineer isn't what's taught in textbook. And um, recently, I, I, I still do art in my free time and I've actually been doing a lot more in lockdown. And I was I was actually doing a little bit of a research about, you know, women in engineering um, and women in art. And I actually found like there's still such a, a, a there's such an issue with, you know, a, a woman in um, textbooks and learning about them as young. Like I was thinking, gosh, I can't even name, a, you know, an influential uh, woman engineer nor artist um, of past. So I think there is a lot to be done in um, the education scheme about how to be, how we can promote that to young people. And we're getting so much better now. Um, so, I mean, equally, I gave a talk to um, a group of, I went to a, a girls' school to give them a talk about um, going into university and the challenges that it faces, because I think that's equally as important as telling about STEM. So I spoke about my work, my work but I also spoke about my experience, because I'm nearly fresh out of uni, Mm. and my mental health struggle during university as well because it didn't stop um after i first i left school it was kind of peaks and troughs um mm. throughout all my education and even during university i um had different uh, separate accommodation for all my exams i got extra time sometimes and i got um uh, counseling through most of uni and i you know i don't think i would have got through uni without those things i think they're really valuable and that's why I, I want to share with the girls because I th there's no, there should be no shame in needing support and therapy. I remember I used to be embarrassed walking into the um, the kind of therapy room in university because it was in a very public corridor and I always used to you know, think oh gosh who's looking at me but I mean had I done that now I'd have no shame and I think it's really healthy to talk about to talk about your mental health mm. um, and so I wanted to tell I wanted to tell the students that you know going to university and being prepared for ups and downs because that's the reality of it you know you're going to have you're going to struggle with with classes it's going to be difficult um you're probably going to go through weird relationships with friends or romantic you know you're going to go through so many different types of you know emotional roller coasters that come with going to uni um so i kind of want to share my experiences and they were really positive the teacher asked me to come back and speak to their parents <laughs> i was like I think I'll pass. <laughs> but um, um, I think I it's really important to be upfront and honest about these things because you know everyone, most people I know have gone through some types of um, mental health issues, and I think yeah. we should all just be you know open and honest about it. And I still I still get um, talk therapy, and I'm very open about that because it allowed me to be the person I am now and to be able to speak and do my job I still get ups and downs naturally um so does everyone um but you know it's mostly ups now because I managed to control it you know that's great I mean we all have our own mental health issues and 
different degrees and so you know it's a brave person that does walk past that door and then finally knocks on it and goes inside and you never know who's watching you but you you know you can think they're watching me because and they what are they going to say about me but they're watching me and thinking well done or maybe they've inspired you know you're now inspiring somebody else to take the same leap so um thank you so much bro i could talk to you for hours i really could <laughs> You too. <laughs> really lovely, lovely. refreshing to talk to you. Um, we're all out of time. Um, oh. Thank you, Adrienne, for posting your questions. But people who maybe wanted to ask a question now and didn't quite, you know, it wasn't the time, you could still get in touch with um, Brogan via um, Engineering um, uh, Talent Awards. You can you find us, the links are there. So if there is anything you think after you finish, whoops, then please do get in touch with us. But thank you so much, Brogan. Um, you. <laughs> I believe she did. So I was going to say on Thursday, which I now know is Brogan's birthday, um, <laughs> is going to be having a chat with Brittany Harris about her nomination for innovation. So um, do follow the links, do stay in touch with Equal Engineers so you know what's happening. We've got so many categories still to talk about. But um, for now, thank you so much again for Brogan. Thank you guys for watching. And we will look forward to um, finally being able to celebrate together very soon. But for now, stay safe, look after yourselves. Thank you.